Hello, this is Flea. I'm here in Los Angeles, California. It's the new millennium. It's 2024. I'm sitting here in my room. I'm feeling centered and comfortable in my body. Here to talk to Scoop about basketball and whatever else he wants to talk about. And um, you're listening to Scoop B Radio. That's right. You know why we're here. It's only right that we bring a legends in the building, legends only, as we are joined by Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Brother, what's going on? Nice to see you, sir. I'm, I'm just sitting here enjoying water, enjoying the day, taking a little respite from my 15-month-old boy who's running around like a little animal. <laughs> Back in my little work spot. I like it. I like it. How do you stay creative and motivated? Um, you know, I'm 61 years old, Scoop. And I feel more creative and more motivated than I ever have in my life. And it's something that's um, always building within me. And I think, you know, number, number one, the most important thing for anybody in any walk of life is to always nurture your spirit. Like anything, like, yeah, your body, your mind, of course. But your spirit, like if you don't have a humble spirit and you're not always trying, like realizing when things are, things are dimming it, Mm -hmm. to stay away from them and things that build them to encourage them, then, you know, you're in trouble. But for me, you know, I'm a student. I'm a student of everything. I'm always failing. I'm always making mistakes, but I'm always yearning and I'm always trying and I'm always in awe. Mm -hmm. I'm in awe. That's like one of the reasons I love basketball. You know, that's what I want to talk to you. It's like, like, it's like music. It's like art. It's like literature. It's something that's infinite. And I'm in awe of it. And, you know, I'm still out there. Yesterday, I'm out there trying to, you know, work on my jump shot after training with Lethal Shooter. Like, trying to, like, come on, man. Come on, Flea. Get, it, get, get that shot falling. You know, I'm always trying, whatever I'm doing. Yeah, sure. you just said um, a mouthful there. You said you're training with Lethal Shooter. How did that even come about? Well, that actually happened. I haven't been, but during the pandemic, that happened. Okay. And it's because, I mean, number one, I just love basketball. Like, I just love it. It's beautiful to me. And I, since I was a little boy, it's been a steady thing in my life. It's been a sanctuary. It's been, you know, it's steady. It's always there. And I've always had a terrible shot. It used to go in when I was, but I played a lot. I was a kid, always went in, but I never learned to shoot properly. You know what I mean? I had this weird, like, two-handed little kid shot, but just how I shot since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. I was like, Damn, I need to learn how to shoot right at my ripe old age. Right. And, so, and he had contacted me once on Instagram or something. I can't remember, but I was like, dude, can you teach me? And he said yes. And he just started coming over. And it was actually really cool. Like, for one thing, he taught me how to shoot. It was really hard at first. It felt ridiculous, you know. But now it feels really natural and I have so much fun, like having good form and always working on it. But um, it was cool. Like at the time when he was coming, it was right. Like all the riots were going on and, and you know, Black Lives Matter movement and stuff. And we were at my house like all the time and just like having a dialogue and stuff. And I really appreciated that during that time. You know what I mean? And uh, it was great. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, you you and I connected on basketball, um, but I'm curious. Um, I know for me, 91 in the Bulls was my point of, of reference or uh, mm -hmm. when, I, when I started watching the game. Was there a specific pivotal moment for you when you started to really like the game? Was it 79 with Magic and Bird? What was the point for you where you really honed in and said, I like this game? Well, there's a few points. I mean, the big point was just for me personally, I moved to Los Angeles when I was 11 years old and I was halfway through sixth grade. I'd been living in like one culture in New York. I came to LA and I didn't know anybody. And I just saw kids playing basketball all day. And I was like, if I'm going to make friends, and I'm going to fit in. I got to play basketball. <laughs> and I just started going every day and shooting and shooting and playing and playing. And I just fell in love with it. And it was just my way of, of communicating and having a, a communal place to be. But in terms of really being a basketball fan, my mom took me it was 75 to go to a Laker game, right when the Lakers got Kareem. Mm. And, you know, we're up in the nosebleeds, the forum, and I'm watching Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And I just fell in love with him. 
And then I started seeing in a newspaper things he would say, things he would do. And it was just that hook shot and the way he moved and the goggles. And he was just like this, like extraterrestrial being, you know, and he was super smart, like this real intellectual. And I loved jazz when I was a kid. I wanted to be a jazz trumpet player. And he, he talked about jazz and all this stuff. And I was like, I love this guy. And then, you know, we couldn't afford to go to Laker games when I was a kid. But, but um, as time went on and then they got magic, and then I started like getting to the games and then it was, you know, the, the Showtime Lakers, Magic and, and Kareem. And then we got, uh, you know, Byron and Michael Cooper and Byron Scott, Michael Thompson, that whole team. Uh, it was just so beautiful to me. And the way that Magic Johnson would run the fast break, you just didn't know what was going to happen. It was, I'm telling you, man, it was thrilling. You couldn't take your eyes off it. And that's when I really fell in love with being a fan of professional basketball and with this super. And one of the things I love about it too, is like, it brings out this, a very childlike feeling, you know, like, yeah. and I kind of like <laughs> the more I know about basketball, I get worried sometimes that I'm going to stop acting like a little kid. Like, I don't want to be a grown up about this. Like I don't want to appreciate other people's games. And I do, you know what I mean? I see all these other games. I realize how all these beautiful players, but I just like, I love, being a little kid and loving my team and like, you know, everyone else is the enemy, fuck them. You know, so, so that, I mean, that's really fun to do that, you know, to just, um, it's like kind of like tribal or whatever, you know, us versus them. Um, but I, I can't help but appreciate other players now, but that was the, the Showtime Lakers was a thing that really, like since then, you know, early eighties, I haven't missed a Laker game. You know, I, I used to like before computers and stuff, I used to go on tour I'd be in Europe and I would like literally, you know, take the phone, call my wife and be like, put the phone by the TV, <laughs> put, put the phone by the TV. I sit up there like running up the bill in a hotel, listening to check her and call the Laker game on the phone for two and a half hours. You know, I, I just, you know, I go deep. You are a, uh, a basketball historian. Uh, you're a Laker uh, expert, but also uh, you just love the game, and, and you're more than uh, qualified to answer this question. Um, when you looked at Magic and you looked at his game and his size and you look at guys that have come after him like Grant Hill as well as LeBron James, do you get any of the same feelings watching Grant Hill or LeBron that you did when you watched Magic in his prime? No. I don't. I, I, you know, they're both phenomenal players. Grant Hill was great. Um, LeBron could be the greatest player of all time. Um, but it's just different. Like the way that it was that fast break, man, he passed behind his head mm -hmm. and it wasn't like to just like to be fancy. It was because he knew it was going to work and no one would know it was coming. Mm -hmm. So it, there was just nothing else like it. And I'm not saying that like, I don't get feelings from other players. Sure. that are really profound, but not the same. Magic was, I mean, he was a 6'9 point guard with eyes in the back of his head who could do it all, you know? And I say LeBron might be the most similar in terms of like, you know, the size and all the abilities. Mm -hmm. um, even though I think LeBron has probably grown into a better shooter than Magic. Yeah. Um, but not like that, not the fast break. And I, I tell you just like Grand Hill was great, but I didn't see him enough to really know. Fair. You know? I mean, there's been a lot of like super exciting point guards since then. I mean, there's super exciting point guards today, you know, but not like Magic. No, Magic was one of a kind. And I think what made Magic special um, was his good customer service pre-social media. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the uh, to me, when I look at Magic, he, he lives by that old adage that you, you treat the janitor the same way you, you treat the chairman of the board. He was very engaging. You know, and whenever I've met, I've met him and, you know, I'm just a Laker fan. He's always taken time, always been there. You know, like someone kind of talks to you, like to get it done and move on. Mm -hmm. He's not like that, like sits there and engages. And like, I can feel like he's seeing me, he's listening to me, he's talking to me. Um, yeah, I, you know, amazing. I, I, but for me, I think the thing that stuck with me the most, and I think as a musician too, like I'm a bass player and, you know, I, I, sometimes my job to take the lead, but oftentimes my job to support and to set everybody up, you mm -hmm. know, to make the bet. And, and he, like, he was specialized in that, you know, like he, 
he made everyone so much better. And I don't know if there's ever been another player that has done that as well. Like what he did to, to everyone else's games, including, you know, the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who obviously was already great and got a ring with Oscar Robertson in Milwaukee. But, but he was, you know, the way that he uplifted Worthy and Byron Scott and everyone that was around him, it, it was amazing. You know, and I don't know if there's been another player that's had that effect, you know, so intensely. There might be. I mean, can you think of anyone? Michael, but differently. And it's less from the style of play. It's more about the global impact. But it's from a, from a playing perspective, probably the only other person I can think of off the top of my head is Jason Kidd. And he was shorter than Magic. Yeah, yeah. And Jason Kidd was great. You know, and Michael... You know, I think Michael is the greatest one-on-one -on -one player of all time on offense and maybe on defense. He, right. When he when he locks somebody down, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think you know, the closest kind of thing to him is Kobe, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, not that, like, my I am going to go out there tonight and I am going to make everybody's light shine as bright as it can be because I know that's, the, that's you know, that's what he did. Fleet, tell me something. Yeah. Why was the Red Hot Chili Pepper so attracted to hip hop and able to seamlessly infuse it into their music? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, with us, well, first of all, we were around for the birth of hip hop, you know. I mean, we were seeing Africa Bombada, an Egyptian lover, um, you know, all the local LA rappers, Ice T, like 1980. 1981, 82, you know, we were, we were going to see hip hop shows. Mm -hmm. um, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, you know what I mean? Like early, early hip hop uh, in the West Coast. We, if it was there, if it was happening and we knew about it, we went. Um, but for us, it was just because it was beautiful music. It wasn't really about anything but that. Like I grew up a jazz fan, you know, and which is, you know, for me, the most sophisticated music, the most cerebral, most spiritual, most visceral, revolutionary music. And that's black American music, you know? And for me, that was like set the bar, the high bar for culture. And hip hop was such a direct outgrowth of that, you know? Um, and it just made sense to me. I just loved it, you know? And it just, when it, it was undeniable music. So anything that I love, is always going to like organically be a part of who I am. And I think it was like that for us. It wasn't like we're like, oh, let's use hip hop because it's a valuable ingredient and we can add that with that and we'll be really unique. It wasn't like that. It was just like, this is a vibrating in the air all around us and we are, our hearts are open to the world, you know? Sure, oh, sure. You know, our connection is basketball, but music is definitely um, a safe space and a safe place. Um, I'm curious, you know, in basketball, people talk about their Mount Rushmore. For you, who, not limited it to four, but who are some of the people that you've enjoyed working with um, in music, collaborating with, and why? Um, God, there's so many, you know, and for different reasons. You know, of, co of course, my bandmates, you know, who I've been with, you know, for, we've been together 42, 43 years, something like that. Um, but... You know, uh, Rick Rubin, yeah. you know, made about, you know, five or six albums with him, something like that. And once again, he's a guy that, you know, is really on the ground floor of, of hip hop, hip hop, hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really appreciate um, his intellectual capacity and his willingness and ability to not a lot of producers kind of have a thing that they do, you know, um, and like you go to be with, say, like Danger Mouse, because he's going to do his Danger Mouse thing. Or, mm -hmm. you know, if like, you know, DJ Premier or RZA or, you know, any great producer, but most of them have a sound that they do and you get with them because you want that sound. Mm -hmm. But Rick is, is one of the rare producers who is able to just see an artist for who they are and see their essence and just do what it can what he can to bring their essence to life that's why he's able to work with someone like us or he worked with run dmc or jay-z and then he did like slayer and the dixie chicks or mm -hmm. johnny cash like it's just music to him and he sees the beauty and all and everything and so him um you know george clinton 
um, you know, he produced our second album and I've had a long ongoing creative and personal relationship with him. He's somebody that, you know, I grew up idolizing, you know, mm -hmm. Parliament Funkadelics, one of my favorite musical entities ever. Um, and one of the, you know, a national treasure and just working with him and the warmth of his spirit, you know, uh, really uplifting for me and i learned so much from him like just like specific knowledge about how to make music how to perform music um you know just how to be an open-minded person sure sure tell me something what is the hardest and easiest part about working with in a band with anthony chad and john um well the hardest thing is it's like a marriage you know um, you're with someone for so long in a creative, communally creative situation, and it can be, uh, you make yourself very vulnerable in a creative situation, you know, um, for all of us. And so you might have, a, you know, have a creative idea. I'm like up all night with this idea and I'm all excited. Oh, I can't wait to show this to the guys in the morning. I'm going to come in rehearsal. They're going to be like, oh man, three, three is a badass. I come in, you got to check this out. I have this idea for the song and I play it and I'd be like, eh, you know, it's cool, but kind of done something like that before i don't know you know let's try this other thing i like ah my my broken you know what i mean like like in, in one minute and just like little things you're around someone all the time i don't know if you have brothers or sisters or you know things with family or if you're married you know it could be hurtful and hard and it brings out you know those things are really like just the personal stuff is really hard and also you know the, the challenge of remaining creative and trying to evolve and change and not like just do something because it works. Like, oh, we can do the same thing we did because we know we're going to make money if we do it. You know what I mean? Like, so, um, but the, you know, the easy thing is that we love one another and we know that when we play together, it's going to sound like no one else in the world but us. And it's just, and that's just there. Like we can get into a room and just pick it up and, and attack our instruments. And it's just an organic, natural thing. It's like breathing or walking, you know? Um, and that's beautiful. Yeah. Listen, I, um, I'm preparing for this interview. I was looking through some lyrics. Mm -hmm. Psychic spies from China try to steal your mind's elation and little girls from Sweden dream of silver screen quotation. And if you want these kinds of dreams, it's Californication. Million dollar question. In 1999, yeah. trying to warn us about China and Hollywood. <laughs> well, you know, I, I can't, Anthony writes the lyrics, like 99.9% .9 of the lyrics, so I don't feel right speaking about his lyrics, you know, but, um, you know, I just know he's looking at the world, and I, I think it's, you know, I, obviously I can't speak for him, but the way I see it is he's living in California, and you're just seeing that stuff. You know, we grew up around show business, you know, even though, you know, we weren't in it at all when we were young, something that came to us, we just wanted to be a good band. But mm -hmm. um, you see these things, you know, it's like this California thing, it's this constant influx of people, you know? And even before we was the computer and we called it content or whatever, and all this Hollywood and money, you see that stuff. It's like, it's just this constant moving these chess pieces and people's um, relentless desire for fame and power and money and to be next to it or near it or in it, you know. Um, and it's, you know, it's energy that makes the world move and it's also disheartening and kind of disgusting. <laughs> no, that's fair. On a, on, a, on a much lighter note. Yeah. I'm in a group text with some of my buddies from high school. Uh, yeah. Sean, my boy, Jeremy, my boy, Ted. And they want me to ask you, <laughs> actually did smoke weed with the Big Lebowski. Wait, what about smoking weed in Big Lebowski? Did you smoke weed with Big Lebowski? Oh, oh, with, um, with, 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 <laughs> um, with Jeff? Yes. Um, no, no, I don't, because we're, you know, we work together and we weren't smoking weed on the set. Um, but I do enjoy some weed myself from time to time. Um, but no, we didn't, but. Um, it probably would have been a good idea. <laughs> yeah, it would lighten the mood some. You are in California, it's legal. Yeah, but you know, man, when they're saying like, the cameras and they're saying action and stuff, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta be present, man. You do. You gotta be of pure and clear mind and make sure that the creative juices are flowing 100%.
Yeah, and just being completely conscious. And I'm not saying that, you know, someone isn't completely capable. Of, and I'm, I know that there have been many great acting performances that have occurred um, under the influence of weed. Sure. No, that didn't happen. Sure. Will you play with James Addiction and bring Dave with you in a reunion tour or anything? Um, I doubt that will ever happen. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Um, what other things are you working on um, that people should be paying attention to because you're full of creative juices? Um, you know, I'm always, like I said, I'm a student, you know, and I'm always working. Right now, I'm really into playing the trumpet and yeah. um, working on making a jazz trumpet album. Um, and, you know, with Chili Peppers, we, we put out two albums last year. We've been on tour for like a year and a half. And right now we're taking a break. We're next month, we're starting up and you know, going to Japan, doing a couple of months in the States. And, uh, and then after that, I intend to record this trumpet album. Um, but, you know, man, I'm this constant. I'm writing, I'm working on music, I'm uh, engaged in creative pursuits. It's my life, you know, artist life. Man. You know, it's interesting when you talk about the trumpet, people know you as, as a bassist, but you know, in today's NBA, you, you you can be a point guard, but you can also play power forward or small forward when you need to. I think that's significant in music at this point because versatility is key. In hip hop, people at first scratched their head when they saw Andre 3000 put out something that was not rap. Did yeah. you check that out? And, and what do you think about that? Um, well, I love Andre. And I went to see him play the other night. He did a flute performance and it was absolutely hypnotically beautiful. Um, the album, I liked the album. I don't think he went around, he didn't go about it in a way that I would have, I wanted him to. Um, I thought that, you know, this flute, cause he's, it's such a beautiful sound when he plays it. And I felt like the sound kind of got lost in all the synthesizers and stuff. Um, I, I, I would like it more stripped down, more like when I, and when I saw him perform live, that's what it was like. It was like right. all flute and everyone was kind of improvised. And it was cool because it was all improvisation, which is such a risky thing to do. Because when you're improvising, you can have the moments of the most sublime poetry, but it can also be self-indulgent bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and it was completely sublime and beautiful and poetic. And I was so excited to see him play. And I love that guy. And I love that he did it. And that's what I always want for everybody, you know, to not chase a dollar, but to, to, to chase their heart and to, to engage, you know, like I said before, you know, to nurture their spirit. And it's like when you always, it's like, whether you're a basketball player or you're, you know, a musician or an actor or whatever, like and people, they go on, well, I'm going to go do this other thing now. And it's always some big thing. I'm going to do a production company or I'm going to make this big thing. or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, blah, blah. but someone like, I'm going to go make ceramics or I'm going to play the clarinet or I'm going to play the flute. You know what I mean? I'm going to do something that I find beautiful and I'm going to let my body vibrate and do it, you know? And, and uh, it's, to me, it's inspiring and hats off to Andre, you know? And, you know, that segues into, I guess my next question for you is, you know, you, you look at today's, music industry it, to me people your age may frown upon it because it's like everything is digital back in my day we did this or we did that well for somebody younger it's a blank slate because you have social media and you have uh, just a million and one things at your fingertips um are you one of those old heads that squats down or do you see what the future looks like and 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 look at it with with an open mind um i love all music we're talking about music specifically right in general yeah all yeah. Music. yeah i mean look when i was a kid almost all the musicians i loved and and i'm talking about like where you're talking about like p-funk or shalimar earth wind and fire or led zeppelin or black sabbath all these bands they played in a room live they looked at each other they made mistakes they were human beings. The way that they were feeling emotionally in that particular day influenced what they were doing. If one guy was angry, the other guy might freak out and it made the music have a funny tension to it. And they rolled tape and they played live. They put up a microphone, they recorded it. And all this classic music that we listened to, that's how it was done. 
today, so much music is made by one person sitting with a computer or with, you know, collaborating, making electronically, building beats, doing it perfectly, making every little thing in its place on a grid. And it's completely valid also. It's a polar opposite way of going about it, but it's all music. Like you can go to John Coltrane, you can go to Bach or Beethoven, you can go to Louis Armstrong. It's all relative, man. It's all someone expressing themselves through the, the tools that are available to them. And I mean, I do think that for anybody, no matter what kind of art or music they're making, it's very valuable to study history, mm -hmm. to go back behind today. Like if you're a kid today making hip hop and say you love Dilla, like on my shirt, you go back to listen to what was Dilla listening to. And then, well, who was he listening to before that? Go back the generations and learn, you know, and the more you learn, the more it's going to inform you to express yourself through the, your current means of, of expression, whatever your vehicle may be. You know, there's like, because the thing is like a B flat is a B flat is a B flat. And when you put it next to an E flat or a D, it's going to make a, a triad and that's going to be a chord. And however you color it is going to create melancholy or yearning or hope or, or celebration. You know what I mean? And it's all relative. So I'm an old head in the sense that I think our history is really important. All history and studying history, you know, artistically, but also, you know, human history. It's like I don't, it's hard to have an accurate take or not a, just a reactionary take on what's happening today without knowing history. I mean, no, because that's the way that we can evolve is by letting, studying history, but through music very much so as well. But to, I love electronic contemporary music. You know, I love it. If you had to scale, I, I, I watched an interview that Drake did years ago before he signed a deal when he was independent. And he talked about how marketing hey, Drake or Dre? Drake. Yeah. When when Drake was um was before he got signed and he was independent, and he talked about how much marketing uh, played a part in I guess the, the musician or the artist or the group telling a story. Um the the art the artistry has to be there, but the marketing has to be there. I think what's unique about you guys is you all have a story. It's kind of like wrestling. Wrestling has a story. Um in today's music genre. How would the Red Hot Chili Peppers introduce themselves to the world as a new artist versus when you guys came in the old fashioned way? Man, that's something I have no idea about. And I really have no idea. I'm really ignorant about marketing, about any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I just like, for me, it's all about be yourself, be true to yourself, give your whole heart to your art form and what comes comes and i feel like if you can touch people's hearts it's going to come people are going to put you in a place where you can be seen people are going to say i saw these dudes play and it touched me you know and and that's that's always been our thing like just do it you know we just went and played any club that would have us we went and slept on people's floor or stayed in motel sixes slept in the van we went out played you know 200 shows in 220 days and one night or in a different city every night you know what i mean just doing it and that's it you know just play uh so i can't really speak to that you know what i mean i'm 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 not really savvy in that way you know if something seems like a good idea i think it's you no know, it's good to be prudent sure. about who you involve yourself with you know over time you learn like don't say yes to everything you know what i mean like you don't want to do all these cheap hustles, man. You know what I mean? Like, like you feel like you can connect with someone like today. I was like, okay, I, I can connect with this man. So I want to speak to him. And, but that's it. Like, I feel like if something is true and it's organic, it's, it will have its time. And if you, you know, you can ride that wave when it's come, when it comes, you're ready, ride it. Tell me something. Yeah. Going on tour. Yeah. What were some of the international places? that you enjoy, that you're still telling stories about to friends and family today? Well, you know, we've played all over the world. It's funny, this morning I was thinking about, well, there's a, I have a couple answers. The first answer is, because I did tell because this was just on my mind this morning. Mm -hmm. I went with, a, this is not with the Chili Peppers. I went with a group of musicians, this guy, uh, Damon Albarn. You know that group, the Gorillas. Mm -hmm. 
The Gorillas had like De La Soul in them, and and uh, anyways, he he has other, also another band called Blur. And, um, but anyways, we went with a group of people twice. I went with him to Africa. We went to Nigeria once uh, and played with like Afrobeat with Femi Kuti and stuff at the Shrine in Lagos. And then we went another time to Ethiopia. And I was just thinking today about like how awesome that was. Like we were in Ethiopia play, playing in these clubs, jamming with these Ethiopian musicians. Ethiopia, man, it's another world. And one point, meet him, just like hanging out, meeting Ethiopian people, walking down the street with this dude, just like showing me around. Walking around this neighborhood, kind of this regular residential neighborhood. I got to poop. I went to the bathroom. I'm like, dude, um, I got to go, I got to take a shit, you know? And he says, he's like, oh, and I'm like, I, there's nowhere to go. You know what I mean? There's no Denny's. There's no anything. It's just like houses. And I'm not going to like go off in the bushes. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like, and he's like, oh, don't worry. It goes, knocks on somebody's door, just some stranger's door. Excuse me, sir. Can my, my friend has to go to the bathroom. Can he use your bathroom? Oh, sure. Come right in. Would you like a cup of coffee and a piece of cake? Come on in and use the bathroom. And I, I go in. They're nice. <laughs> you know, I, talking with some, some family in a house somewhere. Man, if you did, if I came in America to any house in America, went and knocked on the door and asked to use the bathroom. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, like, like, that, like that culture. You know what I mean? Like it was so touching to me and which is in such a base, simple way. You know what I mean? But that was the whole culture of being there. And that was kind of how it was. And, and like all we ever hear about Ethiopia is, oh, people are starving and war and famine. You go there and it's like, you know, these awesome people, poets and artists and workers and people doing all this stuff. And um, so that was really beautiful. Um, that was the first thing that comes to mind. I actually like had a, you know, I was thinking about that this morning, but I remember the first time we went to South America and, you know, we had, we had, it was the first time, you know, we had had a hit. It was like our fourth album, fifth album, something like that. And we had a hit and we showed up and I'm so used to like, you know, get off a plane, go get in the van, you go to the hotel, try to get some rest, go do the show. We walk out, we come out to the airport, and I see the, all this kind of like light and hear noise, like kind of as we walk out of the airport, and I'm like, what, what's going on? Is there like, you know, some, some to-do or something? And walk out, and there's like thousands of people and cameras and lights, and they're screaming and grabbing at us and coming at us, and the security pushing them back. And it's armed guards, like, come on, hustle, get into the, get into the, the car. And I realize they're all there for us. Like, it's the first experience of that, of like mania. And um, that was like really shocking, you know, because we had, you know, I knew we were popular, but that was the first time of that kind of like out of control, like were these mythological heroes like coming into the country. Um, and that was really shocking. You know, I mean, there's been a million weird shows and stuff, but um, that's a couple of things. Wow, well, that, that's... Um... That global perspective is important, man, especially when you put in the work, you enjoy the fruits of your labor, people enjoying and, and, and marveling at your work, but you got to yeah. move me too. Yeah, well, you know, that thing isn't always the most enjoyable either, but... I believe uh, it. <laughs> yeah, and that can be a real, uh, uh, you know, very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the whole fan thing. I mean, these days it's crazy. There's like the... And I, you know, I think this is for anyone who has any degree of fame and, you know, however much I have or we have or people have all relative, you know, but just the camera thing these days, you know, it's like someone come up to me like, Flea, yeah, you, yeah, I'm Flea. Oh, you take a picture? It's like, you know, I don't really want to take a picture, but hey, how are you? What's your name? Where are you from? They don't even want to talk. You know what I mean? Like, hey, what's up? Like, I'm here. I just don't, I'm just over the pictures. I'm not doing it. You know, and they don't even, they don't want to like say hi. They don't want to like, and I'm like sitting here like, like maybe we can have a memorable moment and talk, you know, like, like I might, you might learn something from me. I might learn something from you. Or here we are, a couple of humans in the street. All they want is that picture for their Instagram. Like, and you know, it's, it's that, that's uh, it's strange, man. People living in another reality. I don't you know. I don't even own a smartphone. You don't? I do not. I do not own one. <laughs> So are you still flip phone or black? I got a flip phone. I had a smartphone, but I just looked at it too much, man. So I got a flip phone and, it's not even, and I barely even look at it, man. I, I kind of got off the phone. I did it. I didn't think, you know, I was like, 
And I'm like anybody, it's like, and you know the great reward of not being on it. I mean, there's some things that are hard. I don't have the navigation. I don't have the access to immediate access to music. I don't have to take the pictures of things and stuff like all that. But, but the man, it's like when I stop, say I'm like practicing trumpet, then I'm going to go walk, do something else. It goes in between times, like, you know, before this meeting today or whatever, you know, you have 10 minutes or whatever, you have a cup of coffee or something. I don't, I always would pick up the phone and look at it in that time. So, you know what I mean? Every little downtime. Let me just check that sports scores, whatever. Like, how did the Lakers do last night? I couldn't watch the game. Did Dave Vincent come back? Is he still playing? Why didn't he play the night? Like, I, I don't look at everything all the time. I stare into space. I get bored. I look at the wall. And I feel my mind unraveling, going into that place of like when I was a little kid, you know what I mean? Like when I was a kid, I would lay down on the ground, stare up at the sky and let my mind wander. And that's those spaces of nothingness. And I think those are really valuable spaces for all of us to have. I like that. You talked about time in, in, in more ways than one, just reclaiming your time and using it more for creative process. One, when you talked about the, the, the fans taking pictures uh, rather than having a conversation, I think that the pictures have replaced autographs. Do you oh. do you see that? Um, yeah. Well, thing is, as a musician, they always have on um, the pit guards they want you to sign. I mean, it's pretty constant, like professionals, you know, because mm -hmm. you sign a pit guard for a guitar, and then they go put it on a cheap guitar and sell it as a signed guitar. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's like constant. Like you know, every every hotel I stay at, they're there waiting with them. Every like, time I go to the Laker game, they're there with them out front. You know, um, it's a money. I get it. You know, people trying to make a dollar. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I get it. But um, yeah, you know, both. I mean, I think it's like you know, if they can they can sell the the autographs. So you know, that's there too. Are you a fan of wrestling, past or present? No, mm -mm. I'm not against it. I just haven't never gotten into it. Okay. Yeah. The the reference that you speak of the Lakers, um, Kareem, Kobe, Magic, LeBron, um, Shaq, all of the the whole crew, Byron Scott. Um, I think we're at an interesting point where LeBron is towards the end of his career. I feel like. Um, with Shaq, right? We know him as a Laker. Yeah, the Magic just recently retired his his jersey. Finally, he was the first. But you know, pretty much the 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 Heat, the Magic, uh, the Lakers hold him in such high regard. I think looking down the line, I think LeBron is going to be looked at similarly. Um, we know him as a Cav. We know him as a Heat. He did win a championship in Los Angeles with the Lakers. From your perspective as a diehard Lakers fan, do you think? Um, that at any point, if he were to win another championship at the Lakers, with the Lakers, do you think that at that point it would be worthy enough to discuss potentially giving him a statue in front of crypto? Or do you think that just retiring his numbers 23 and 6 would suffice? Um, if he wins a championship this year, give that man a statue. If he can step up, I mean, it would be phenomenal. For one thing, I'm not one of these guys that ever questioned LeBron. Like there was a sort of thing, like when you got him, Lakers, he's not a real Laker. He was our enemy on the Cavs and the Heat and the, you know, wherever else he was. Um, but if he could do it, this it would just be miraculous, you know, and I would think he would deserve it. And he's been here for when? Is his fifth season, sixth season with the Lakers? Not a while, since, 20, since 2019. Okay, yeah, so fifth season. Okay, yeah. Um, and it's been beautiful to see him play. You know, and absolutely, I, I, I would say if he wins another championship, statue, mm -hmm. statue. He's LeBron James. He's he's and what he's done is like, you know, look, we didn't get prime LeBron. It kind of his whole time in, the, in, in, on the, in a Laker uniform has been, you know, after his prime, you know, um, and even though he's obviously still putting up incredible numbers um, and leading the team. Um, I, I feel like, you know, the cerebral part of his game has just grown and grown. I mean, it's always been there, but the way that he's, you know, constantly teaching the other guys is just as valuable as his physical prime, you know, Even, like, but I, I, um, my, my only, my only, like my, the only thing I struggle with now, and this is a tangent, I'm going on a tangent, excuse me, but it's okay. Okay. Just that I feel like the other guys defer to him too much. I agree. 
you know, and and I think that's that's the problem with this team right now. Like, like they beat Boston without AD and, and LeBron. The other night they beat Milwaukee. Was it Milwaukee they beat without LeBron? Um, and it's not that they're better without LeBron. They're not. There's no way that they're better without LeBron. But it's just they're not like they're just playing free. They're going all out. And they, I know that he wants them to too. But they, they're, they're like especially the younger guys are so in awe of him that if his energy, like sometimes LeBron, he feels it out. He's conserving his energy, and they, they start doing it too. It's like you know, you can't have Rui and Austin Reeves conserving their energy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh-uh. mm-hmm. you know, but. But, um, you know, that's my take on it anyways. But um, absolutely give him a statue if he wins a ring. You know, in my prayers, you know, every night, you know, my wife and I, we say our prayers at night before bed. And I'm like, hey, God, please let the Lakers win a championship this year. And I imagine it, like how beautiful it would be. Yeah. <laughs> I know there's some, some petty stuff to talk to God about, but I can't help it. He never know. He, he He's not always there when you call, but he's always on time, you know. He's got. He's always there. You know. He might say no though. Yeah. Or it's a dream deferred. So I'm curious. You talked about your mom taking you to the old forum, um, and you you guys sat up all the way in heaven, yep. uh, to watch the games. Yep. When you became Flea and the world renowned Flea, do you remember the first time that you sat courtside at a Lakers game? Who did they play, and what was it like? God, I can't remember who they played. I can't remember. It was, you know, 89 or 90 when we signed with Warner Brothers Records. I still didn't have the money to be able to afford seats like that. But Mo Austin, the late Mo Austin, who was a great man uh, and ran Warner Brothers Records, um, he had courtside center seats. And he used he used to give it to, give us to them. Sorry, someone's handing me something. He used to give them to us all the time. And I'd sit center court, and I couldn't even believe it. And it, you know, it was magic and cream. And and I I can't remember the first one, man. But I remember specifically just losing my mind being that close to the game. <laughs> like it was just. And even now, like look, I I've I've had season liquor tickets for twenty something years. Mm-hmm. I, 25 years or so, I've had um, courtside seats now for like four or five years. Mm-hmm. And every time I go sit in those seats, I still have that feeling like I can't believe how amazing this is, you know. And I guess, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I guess like for anyone who loves basketball, it's like going to the ballet or something, you know. It's just going to see these guys that are just it's just so beautiful to watch them play. I, you know, I love it, man. And seeing all, you know, that's one of the thing I was talking about earlier is, is seeing the, all the other players and tr- starting to appreciate other players too much because I don't want to do it because I want them to be my enemy. But like, man, like I, I mean, they played OKC a little while ago and watching Shea Gill just like a beautiful game that kid has, man. That young man is just, you know, it's so beautiful. Like, and seeing all the like, all the work that goes into it, you know, like, like every guy, like you see someone like drive the lane like him and get his body in this position, floating through the air and hang and shoot. And it's like, you know, it's like, it was always talented. Yeah, sure. He's talented, but you know, you know that a million times he did the exercises and the diligence and the work and the, the under the study to do it, to be able to like execute like that, like, all of it, you know, and then the, 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 like, I feel like, you know, I guess, you know, most players to get to the NBA, your work ethic has to be immaculate just to get to be like the 10th, 12th guy on the bench. You know what I mean? But beyond that, it's like spiritually, like someone who's great. I thought about this, you know, the, the Golden State beat the Lakers the other night. To drag, you know, and they they shot like the highest three point percentage ever, or something like the a team, like sixty something percent from three. And I was thinking, it's like when, like I, I kind of was counting Golden State out, like that that window is closed, you know. But it's like when they can shoot free like that, because you know that when they're all unconscious, they're just like letting them fly, you know what I mean? And you got to be, and I feel like with any team or any basketball players, like that's where the test is. Like you could know all the stuff, you could know what to do, you can be a good teammate, you could have done all the work. But 
can you surrender and trust your spirit and let it fly? You know what I mean? Like, can you uh, g- surrender your heart to the moment? It's like giving yourself to God, like giving yourself, like completely trusting to let your spirit take over and go beyond thought, beyond work, beyond diligence. It's like, like the great Charlie Parker, you know, said, you know, and great, the, one of the greatest virtuoso musicians of all time. Yeah, you got to do all the work. You got to know your theory. You got to do all the studies, but then you got to forget it all. Mm-hmm. And, you know, trust yourself. And so, and I, you know, that's the thing. Like, can you do that? Like they did that the other night. Like you don't shoot like that without completely letting being unconscious, you know? And that's like, you know, the spiritual state that spiritual mysticism has been yearning for since the beginning of time. Oh yeah, man, you um dropping Charlie Parker references. Birdland was my album. Oh yeah, man. Well, B- Birdland, the, the weather report uh, song? What you said? You're talking about weather report, Birdland? Because Birdland is weather report. Do, 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 yeah. yeah, that's Weather Report. Yes, um, you know, Charlie Parker did recorded this bebop, you know, in the in the forties and fifties. Yes, yes, um, yeah, I know. I grew up with that music. That's the music I grew up loving. Uh, you know, when I was a kid in New York, my my you know my parents got divorced, and my mom got, got with a jazz musician in, in New York, and and um. Uh, so I got introduced and fell in love to music because of jazz. You know, I didn't even like rock music when I was a kid. I, I loved Charlie Parker and, you know, Dizzy Gillespie and Thelonious Monk. And, you know, uh, yeah, those guys. Those are my heroes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Two more questions. Yeah. Um, did you ever have any interactions with Kobe Bryant? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, several. Nothing, you know, longest, you know, greetings and stuff, but um he was always real cool with me you know always the last time i saw him i was you know sitting in my seat and he came walking behind me and like stopped and gave me a hug like from behind i don't know who it was i'm like it's kobe like just hugging me he's like i appreciate you man you know and and um but i i can't say that i knew him you know what i mean but but i didn't know him well but whenever i met him he always took time always said hello always what's up you know i remember once like right before a big game it was a in the Western Conference final against the Spurs. Um, and I did the anthem. And I was sitting like in the hallway back, like waiting to go out and do the anthem. And he came out and he came up. And I knew like he had game face on, like serious. You know what I mean? It's Western Conference finals. It's Kobe Bryant. Like he's not lighthearted about this. is not a, a you know. And he, and he went out of his way to come over and say hello. Like, I, you know, I really appreciate that, you know. Because I knew that he was, you know, he... He knew my energy was uh, dedicated. No, that's real. OJ Simpson recently yeah. passed away. Uh, did you have any interactions with him in the LAC? Nope, never met him. You know, and I, I feel like like all of that. You know, look here's this guy who was an incredible athlete, um, accused of murder. Most people I know think he did commit that murder. I feel like it's none of my business. You know what I mean? Like, um, and uh, for me, like, it's none of my business. You know what I mean? Like there's crime and awful things and inhumane shit happening around the world constantly. Right now while we're speaking, nefarious people are doing some evil shit. And, um, my whole thing with all that was like, you know, I'm sitting there watching the Eastern Conference Finals, or the or the, the finals on television, New York and Houston, mm-hmm. and then they're kind of all of a sudden they put on the screen the the, the Bronco. I don't want to see the fucking Bronco. I'm watching basketball. This is beautiful. I'll switch to a news channel if I want to see that. Like, give me a break. I hated that. I hated that. Like they put, you know, that was like the first sign of like they're putting what they think is going to get clickbait on my basketball game. I watch basketball because it's beautiful and it's infinite. And it's an opportunity for humanity to rise above the limitations that is, are put on it. And, um, and they're putting it like uh, some guy running away from the cops. I don't want to see it. Or the lighter go. Yeah. How did you keep the sock up? Oh man, it's just cock and ball power. <laughs> wow. Okay. 
Yeah, you know, that's something we used to do when we were a kid, man. You know, a tube sock, it's a tight fit. Um, that's just something we did for a joke, you know. And uh, we took a couple of pictures with it. <laughs> and it went over big, you know. We were funny. It was funny. No, I was like, for us, it was always like, take our music really seriously. And all this like stuff that we did that we thought was funny, you know, can really release tension and laughing is good, man. Laughter is, laughter is good medicine. It's great for the soul, especially in these times. Yes, sir. Uh, here's the good news. Um, you are off the hot seat. Which seat is that? The one I thought you were on. You asked all my questions. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> cool. <laughs> all right, man. Well, Scoop, it's great to speak to you. Well. And, um, you know, maybe I'll see you around uh, basketball somewhere sometime. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, you know, man, I, I, the playoffs are about to start. Should be really fun. You know, I still have hope for my Lakers, man. If they can... You know, it's a bummer about Jared Vanderbilt because he was our best perimeter defender and a real, like, help. Um, last year, we made it to the Western Conference Final. This year, it looks like we're going to end up having it if we get through the play and having to play Denver in the first round. So that's going to be hard, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Yeah. You know? Denver's a well-oiled machine, brother. We can't, we can't sell them short at all. That, no, you cannot. And it just seems like, I mean, you know, like Jokic and Murray, Jokic is just like, the dude doesn't make mistakes. You know what I mean? And he just like, he gets in the paint, you know, it's impossible. And then they got like, you know, like Michael Porter, has he ever missed? I mean, when he plays the Lakers, it's just like every time he gets a little bit of light, he fucking makes it, man. Uh, yeah, no, they're well, they're well oiled. They're well coached. They're, they're, super deep KCP they got all these guys you know they're deep they're yeah. deep but it's not impossible mm -hmm. it's not <laughs> they work cut out for them they got some serious work cut out for them but I think like if they can be healthy and if they can be whole and it's early in the playoffs hopefully they're not tired mm -hmm. um but you know they got a thing is they get the Lakers can't like rest like right now like they gotta step it up last two games are the regular season, they got to try to win these. They got to win the play in, and they got to come in, like you know, with everything they got. So That's we'll see. Right. We'll it. see. But, you know, LeBron. LeBron is a cosmic man. Yes, yes. We gonna see. We're gonna see.